Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are joining us from today. Uh, welcome to the second day of the HHS Small Business Conference. Uh, so we are going to kick off today's session with a really exciting panel on strengthening your small business with academic partnerships. My name is Asim Subedi. I'm the academic innovation lead in the SEED office. Uh, you all must have heard a lot about SEED office and what we do. We're really excited to uh, host this uh, conference virtually this year and welcome you. With that, uh, we'll get to the, uh, the discussion today. Uh, so what we will do today is I will spend maybe five to five or so minutes to give a little overview uh, and set the stage for how small businesses really can strengthen their you know, uh, research pipeline, but also small business SBI or SGTR success rate with academic partnerships. And then after that, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, panel today. Uh, Let's see, there is some issue with moving the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So we have an exciting panel. Uh, we have uh, three uh, folks here who are gonna touch upon different aspects of uh, academic partnerships. They have had you know, experience either uh, doing it themselves or having seen it in their region. Um, so uh, I will start with uh, an overview of, of how do you, how can you really uh, leverage uh, academics during your small business and for SPR, HTTR. And then I'll introduce the panel and we'll just get into the discussion after that. Next slide, please. So you probably saw this yesterday. And for those of you who might have missed yesterday's session, uh, the, the one key difference between SPIR and STTR difference is, uh, is one of them, or SPIR permits partnering, but STTR in fact requires partnering with a nonprofit research institution, so in, including academic partners like universities. So just from the way the programs are designed, we really encourage that academic partnerships. Uh, and so with STTR, you are required to do it SPI, you are allowed to do it. And so if you look at the work requirement for STTR, at least 40% of the work has to be done at the small business, but 30% has to be done at that academic partner, and another 30% could be at another academic partner or the same partner. So as you see, 60% of the work for STTR has to be done to academic partners. So there is really opportunity for you to uh, design your project uh, to with the intent of really partnering with academic institutions. And for SPIR as well, uh, for a phase one, at least one third of the work uh, has to be done at the, uh, you can outsource at least one third of the work, which means you can partner with academic institutions to do that work. And for phase two, you can outsource up to 50% of the work. So uh, the, the message here is, the way the SPR and CTR programs are designed, it is designed to really uh, encourage you to uh, partner with academic institutions. Next slide, please. Um, and so, as I mentioned, there is that requirement. So with STTR, since you're required, academic partnerships are very common with SPR and STTR. And it's not just SPR and STTR. In general, uh, if you think about a small business, most of them, especially in, in biomedical field, do stem from academic research that has happened at university. And so a majority of small businesses do have that partnership already organically built in. And for SPR, STTR, uh, with STTR, you are required to have it. You can do up to 60% of the work with your partner there. And for a majority of SPIR projects also have academic partnerships. Uh, uh, our colleagues at National Cancer Institute SPIR program did an analysis in 2017, and you can uh, see it in the report that was uh, published. 70% uh, of SPIR and 44% of STTR in terms of the grand dollar amount, not just the number of projects, but you know, total amount of money that went out were subcontracted to the academic institution. So uh, if this was just one year data, 2017, but I'm sure the data is uh, you know, the same or even uh, more pronounced other years and uh, throughout the whole NIH SPIR pipeline. Next slide, please. So why do you uh, do academic partnership? What are some of the advantages? So I kind of alluded to the fact that most of the small businesses do stem from, you know, they are spin out of, out of academic institutions from basic research that was done in an academic lab. So academic partnerships are source of really innovative ideas. Uh, if, you, if you look at the biomedical enterprise, 
uh, academic institutions and academic research is the major source of innovation. So you can get exciting, innovative ideas from those partners, and you can then build your small business around it, or you can build, build a small SPR, SGTR technology um, and, and application around it. The other advantage is expertise. You will get your partners from academic institutions who know the science really well. They would be the one who will be able to give you all the expertise you need as you are building your project, you're building your team, and you're moving the technology forward. And the same with resources as well. Uh, you're able to get um, access to a lot of resources that as a small business, you might not have. Your academic partner might have access to some lab and facilities that uh, you want. You will be able, able to leverage with that. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see here, in, in that ties in very well with the review criteria for SPR SGTR. So yes, it will help build a small business, but when you're thinking SPR CTR, those partnerships, in fact, you will help you with your reviews uh, as, as you are being reviewed as well. So the innovative ideas play come into play for significance of the problem, because you know you, the the more innovative idea uh, and you know the, the way to solve a significant problem is with these exciting ideas. And it will definitely help you with innovation score. Uh, for your investigator and approach, the expertise plays, comes into play, so you'll be able to really leverage the expertise and uh, Im improve your odds of getting better score with the uh, those two criteria. And then uh, the resources you can leverage will help you with the environment uh, uh, review criteria. So uh, as you can see, uh, yes, it, it will help you with building the small business, but it definitely will help, also help you with uh, building your SPR uh, uh project. Next slide, please. Uh, so there are a few things that you should think about before uh, you jump into an academic uh, partnership. Uh, you definitely should think of creating an official agreement. Uh, the website here will give you a model agreement that you can use whenever you're uh, putting together SPR SGTR, but that can serve, this model can also serve for other agreements you want to create for with academic institutions. IP is definitely a very critical issue. Uh, you should definitely make sure that there is a clear understanding as to uh, how the IP will be assigned if if that partnership leads to new IP. Uh, so it's something to think about before you get into a partnership. And it's really important to have clear communication of roles and expectations. What is the academic partner going to do? What are you going to do? Next slide, please. I wanted to briefly touch upon, as I mentioned, the whole idea of a lot of exciting innovation comes out of academic labs and academic partnership. And so at NIH, we really understand that idea. So we have created a proof of concept network where the basic premise is supporting academic institutions with the intent of supporting innovators there. We will then leverage the resources and funding from this network to build new startups and small businesses and take it forward. So I wanted to just show the network here as a way to really showcase how uh, that academic partnership is really critical, and you can really leverage it to you know build a build a small business uh, from the the network. Uh, uh, over the last uh, seven years or so, we have had a number of startups that have started from uh, from the work that have come out of the network. There have been a lot of partnerships between small businesses and uh, and the uh, network as well. Next slide, please. And so the the theme of this conference is we are really interested in uh, diverse perspectives and how we can seed use that as a uh, seed to uh, come up with impactful innovations. Right. So. We wanted to see how the the SPIR and SDTR uh, portfolio, uh, how those small businesses, what percent of them are partnering with minority serving institutions, just with the goal of really de diversifying the portfolio and also leveraging the wealth of resources that are out there and increasing the diversity of the, act, the uh, biomedical workforce and making sure that uh, the projects we're supporting um, are thinking uh, and, and really encouraging work from underrepresented minorities. So in 2019 and 2020, we saw that at least around seven to nine percent of STTR awards had uh, partnership with MSI, um, our minority serving institutions. The list was uh, based on 2020 data from US Department of Education. So we, I mean, it's, you know, it's good to see that there is some of this partnership happening, but there is definitely room to do much more than this. Uh, and that's going to be one of the focus of our discussion. We'll kind of touch upon how, what were some of the advantages of partnering with minority serving institutions? What are some of the exciting resources that are there that we are not tapping into and how we could do it better? Next slide, please. 
Uh, so there are a few programs that we have ongoing to really increase that diversity. Um, and my colleague Stephanie and Eric yesterday had uh, sessions to talk about that. Uh, applicant assistance program is one. There was a session around that. And then we also have diversity supplement. Wanted to quickly mention it here, uh, but you know, definitely go check out the other uh, uh, sessions when those videos are available. But, but uh, you can also uh, go to that PA18837 and find out more about it. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, now we can get into the meat of the discussion. Uh, so I'm we're really glad that we have a, a, a very good panel today. Uh, we have Kelly Drew, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Be Cool Pharmaceuticals. Uh, Jonathan Holyfield, who is a senior vice president of New Economies as at uh, Bitwise Industries, and Monique Quickendall Quarterman, who is the executive director of Kentucky Commercialization Ventures. So, what we'll do next is uh, we will have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, we'll have Kelly go first, and then Jonathan and Monique, and touch upon a little bit about you know your background and how you have in your own experiences leveraged academic partnership and you know some of the ways of doing it so we'll start with that and then uh we have a few other you know topics we'll touch upon but please uh you know put your any questions you have put it in the q a box and uh, once we have some discussion here we'll start answering your questions so kelly uh would you uh like to get started Sure. So I'm Kelly Drew, and uh, I wear two hats all the time. I'm uh, the CEO of Be Cool Pharmaceutics, but I'm also a professor and uh, uh, director of an NIH-funded center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, I am excited about the STTR SBIR program because uh, commercialization, in my mind, is the path to translation. So everything that we do uh, that is innovative and exciting it will stall if we're not able to move it into, into new therapy. So I'm really excited about the program and excited about telling, telling my experiences with it. Thank you, Kelly. Jonathan? Good afternoon, Jonathan Hollifield. It's a pleasure to be here. And by way of background, I have a long history in tech and innovation-based economic development. And as you know, uh, academic and business partnerships have that symbiotic relationship building off of Kelly's comments that lead to commercialization and ultimately translation into the market. It's like the bedrock principle of what we're trying to accomplish. Most recently, I was um, executive director of the White House Initiative on HBCU. And with that academic business partnership lens, we drove hard toward increasing HBCU partnerships with the private sector and particularly small business. And I too look forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Jonathan. Monique? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this, this afternoon. My name is Monique Kirkendall Quarterman, and I serve as Executive Director for Kentucky Commercialization Ventures. It's an initiative um, that is led by KSTC that unites all of Kentucky's um, public colleges and universities and community and technical colleges around commercialization and innovation. We also foster statewide collaborations for innovation and commercialization, like the Kinetic Hub. Um, which specializes on, in translating biomedical innovations um, across all of Kentucky's higher education centers. Um, and I'm also proud um, to co-lead um, the EDI Working Group um, on behalf of the NIH Proof of Concept Network um, in partnership with my other co-lead, Dr. Julius Corley, and also grateful for your leadership as our contact, uh, or as our contact Ashim. Thanks, Monique. So, uh Maybe we, we can start with the discussion, as I as I mentioned about. Uh, so I, I sort of laid the groundwork for with SPR HTTR how you know we really encourage that academic partnership, right? So uh, it would be good to you know get your take on how you think. I mean, I gave some examples of how it could be beneficial, how small businesses can really benefiting benefit from working with academics. Uh, so if from your experiences, you can touch upon uh, how one, those partnerships can be built. And Ka Kelly, I think your personal experience would be really uh, interesting for everyone to hear. But also 
what do you think are some of the advantages like and benefit and how you know the small businesses can benefit from building such partnerships well i think it i think you're absolutely right that the innovation comes from the academic side because that's what we are paid to do really you know and and we don't have the pressure of uh, trying to make something useful initially. We're just trying to figure out how things work. But um, you know, once we have that innovation, we really need the the business side to understand how to move it forward. So I have benefited substantially from um, from colleagues in the um, in the uh, uh, business sector. Uh, who have inspired me and other colleagues at the university who found opportunities through commercialization avenues. And um, and so for me in Alaska, I uh, um, had innovation that I wanted to commercialize, but I had no biotech to partner with. And so as an academic, I had to create my own uh, company. And so now, I run that company and work with myself as, as my academic. <laughs> it's not ideal, but you got to start somewhere. And I really look forward to building the biotech uh, capacity in Alaska because I think that we do have innovation that is in part um, place specific. Uh, some of the environment that we work with, some of the challenges, the, the diversity of um, people and problems, uh, we have unique innovation here. And, uh, but it's been really uh, fortunate that the, I was here at a time that the university found uh, that it was important to open these opportunities. And so they've worked really well in um, uh, removing barriers to making this work. So they, of course, it took them at least two years uh, to develop um, the the framework for uh, conflict of interest plans for faculty to be able to hold these uh, business um, uh, positions uh, and as well as maintain their academic positions. Uh, and they have uh, worked really well developing their Office of Commercialization and Intellectual Property and developing also templates for uh, supporting IP and uh, partnering uh, with the companies. They've worked really well with me. Uh, it took a while for our first licensing agreement. Uh, I would say about a year of me just sitting on it until they came around <laughs> to what I could work with. But it's exciting. It's exciting to see um, things develop. And I think it's uh, really good for science to move it forward. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, so, Monique, I know, like you know, from the local regional perspective, right? In in you have been involved with Kentucky Commercialized Inventors. You are involved with Kinetic Hub, uh, and so you know you are involved with a lot of technical colleges there. So, from your perspective and what you have seen, uh, how have you encouraged those partnerships in your local ecosystem? And what are some of the advantages you see? And you know, do you see organic? things organically happening? Have you, do you have programs to support it, build it? Uh, so, you know, it would be great if you could talk a little bit about your experience from, from the local and regional ecosystem. That's a great question. I love that question. And here in Kentucky, we have created a bit of an advantage with the development of KCV. Um, so we are partnered um, with KSTC, University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, our Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development, and the Kentucky Council on Postsecondary Education. And what that does is it spreads our reach from corner to corner of our state and makes us a one-stop shop for um, academic and industry partnerships. Um, and so we're always um, advertising opportunities to connect with our innovators in, in several ways. Um, we've had several questions about connecting with the talent and facilities that are ample and available across our state. Um, there's also an opportunity to access that expertise, right? Um, where an innovator may not have a role in the small business um, on the executive team of a startup, um, but can consult them and support them um, to, to gather that technical background um, that they need to go after some of these wonderful SBIR, STTR programs. We are an open door to all kinds of opportunities. Um, and although we launched in July of last year, we've already seen a ton of movement 
everything from our regional um, and rural colleges and universities um, winning pitch global pitch competitions um, to being able to interact um, with existing commercialization programs um, like Kinetic in, in entirely new ways. Um, so we always have a door open for partnership. Thank you, Monique. Uh, so we can I mean, maybe switching gears a little bit. I mean, I kind of talked a little bit about uh, how there is uh, some sort of partnership that is already going on with between small businesses and minor deserving institutions uh, within the STTR program and also with the SPIR program. But there is a lot of opportunity there. Uh, I mean, Jonathan, you have kind of, you know, you've been working on this space quite a bit in terms of really looking at inclusive competitiveness, right? How you can really take innovation and, you know, from that inclusion perspective and create economic prosperity. Uh, so it would be rather than just sort of, you know, and we can get into discussion of maybe some ways we could improve that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, number and partnership. It would also be really great for everyone to hear some of the advantages, what are the, the resources out there and like, you know, the wealth of resources within these minority serving institutions that are there to be tapped that, you know, small businesses can really take advantage of. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. And I certainly concur with what my colleagues on the line and their experiences have been taking a more underlying um, uh, uh, enabling approach, um, a gap in this um, loosely connected ecosystem, frankly, is on the front end. And it's a recognition that minority serving institutions, HBCU, are actually a strategic advantage for their local community, for their people, for their institutions, and of course, for their small businesses. Oftentimes, the narrative around these institutions is only support them, support them, support them. We can evolve that narrative to be also through these institutions, they are conduits to open up all kinds of new opportunities for businesses as well as their surrounding communities. So they themselves are conduits for greater investment. And that's the kind of uh, recognition uh, that we've tried to promote. You know, I was founding executive director of Cincy Tech in Cincinnati. Um, worked in Kentucky and Monique and I go back and forth about that. But for folks like me, when a big opportunity from NIH comes about, we ask three questions. Who and what do I need to aggregate? How do I organize them into an actionable form? And how do we leverage them to get a disproportionate amount of that value either to my company or to my community? But it begins with aggregating your strategic advantages. And if MSIs, HBCUs are viewed as providing a strategic competitive advantage for their local markets, then they will be part of that aggregation process because you always bring the key assets together that can enhance your ability, again, to win a disproportionate amount of that money for your community or for your enterprise recognition that these institutions provide strategic advantages. That's the underlying point. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'm gonna, maybe Kelly, since you sort of have this unique perspective of having running a small business and also being at University of Alaska, which is, you know, one of the minority serving institutes, right? Uh, from your perspective as well, like how have you really leveraged the resources and like, you know, what are some of the advantages that you have found of, I get, you know, you are in a unique situation because you came up with the technology, you sort of partnered, but, uh, you know, from your perspective, like what are some of the unique resources that are available uh, and how have you leveraged some of the, those resources? Well, so um, we really have no biotech, we have no incubators, so we have a, we have a dry incubator that just came online about a year ago. Um, and so our university has been very open, again, taking a lot of time to get there, but very open to uh, being able to um, rent their facilities. 
uh, from the company. So just like I can rent space in my existing lab uh, through a, a, an agreement. It, they're also in terms of um, with the sub award to the university, uh, they're very open for company employees to come and go uh, and work alongside uh, uh, the university employees. Um, and so obviously without the infrastructure of the university, the business wouldn't have been able to do uh, wor any work at all, really. Uh, and so part of that uh, work has been um, through a sub award to the university with just, a, you know, standard academic roles, but also it's opened opportunity for um, the company employees to use those facilities. Uh, and, you know, uh, as long as we've met certain criteria in terms of uh, liability insurance and different things that the university needs in place, it really has opened up opportunities to bring the private sector um, into the university uh, resources so that both can benefit. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, maybe we can also, before we get into the question, I sort of wanted to put out like one last theme thought and, you know, would love to get your thoughts on that as well. I mean, so, you know, we really want to encourage that, uh, you know, participation from underrepresented groups in a small business programs, right? And, uh, and some of that also entails working with these minority serving institutions as, as Jonathan, you rightly pointed out, it's, you know, taking it as an advantage, an opportunity rather than like, you know, just, okay, we need to go and like give them something or like, you know, fill that gap. Uh, so there are certain things that we are doing uh, at, at NIS level, the like diversity supplement I mentioned, academic you know, ass assistance program. What are some of the other sort of approaches or programs that we could you know, work on to bolster this partnership between small businesses and, and these minority serving institutions with the overall goal of improving diversity in general? So uh, Monique, maybe we can get started with you and then, you know, Jonathan and, and, and Kelly, maybe you can, in fact, touch upon your experience with diversity supplement as well. So uh, we'll start with Monique. Sure. I'm so excited for that question um, because, as you're aware, when we um, started the um, EDI working group within the Proof of Concept Network, one of the first things we did was look across the nation for some of the best practices and programs that are doing the work every day. Um, and so two programs that I'll mention, for example, um, one is the Enrich program, which is led by Dr. Almisha Campbell out of Jackson State University in partnership with the University of Kentucky and the Southeast Accelerator Network, where they are working with HBCUs to support commercialization um, in a cohort format, um, which I'm so excited. Um, one of my team members is serving as a mentor for it. It's just a phenomenal program that really leverages the strength of both um, the backgrounds and the proof of concept network connections. Um, another example I'll share um, is led by um, Dr. Grant Warner at Howard University, which is Black Tech Ventures. And similarly, they're working on connecting more faculty, staff, and students to entrepreneurship, um, especially STEM entrepreneurship. Um, so they're interacting every day with HBCU students um, and getting them access to wonderful opportunities like the SBIR, STTR program, um, but also helping America's competitiveness in research and innovation. It's so many, um, there's so many ways that these institutions um, can contribute to and help drive us forward um, in thinking. And I'm just so excited about what these programs are doing to really change that focus and narrative. Thanks, Monique. Jonathan, it looks like you're on mute. <laughs> Damn, I'm sorry. Uh, Monique, you really hit it square on the head. And when we talk about diversity supplement, the worst diversity supplement is that which adds no value. The best sustainable diversity supplement, obviously, are those that add value and ultimately feed to local, state, regional, ultimately national competitiveness, align, helping to better align our institutions, our MSIs and HBCUs with the priorities of the nation. Um, I'm a former football guy and there's a thing called the coffin corner on the playing field. And that the ball goes into the coffin corner to die, 
Okay, that's pretty graphic, but I'm going after the point. We want to play on the entire playing field, not just be relegated to a narrow set of opportunities, but grow with the nation's needs. And we can be great partners with uh, small businesses in myriad areas that we're just now seem to be grappling with in a very serious way. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, Kelly, it would be really helpful to sort of get your personal perspective as well on this, right? So I know you have, uh, you know, submitted diversity supplement and really leverage it and taken advantage of it to really uh, improve in a way like diversity of the workforce, but also help your small business uh, move the technology forward. So could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, there's a lot of talent out there uh, and any kind of opportunity to be able to leverage that talent uh, is moving in the right direction. Uh, the diversity supplements just, um, you know, initially for the small business awards are a little challenging because uh, technically you're supposed to have a year of support when you apply for those supplements and often the awards themselves are just a year long. So that's something that I hope is being addressed. Um, there's there's also a challenge uh, with, um, and maybe the supplement, you know, the way I did, have done the supplements, they have been through the university. Um, and so I just never tried through the company and that would have worked the biggest barrier to getting, when you have this, con this option, you've got the university or you have the company and you're trying to hire people into this, the university has a huge advantage because of their benefits. It's sometimes very difficult to get somebody that wants to work for the company rather than for the university. And so if there was anything we could do to get around that, that would be great because um, I just see a lot of potential and opportunity for all people, in, including we have so many uh, Alaska Native uh, individuals here in Alaska looking for opportunities not necessarily in academics and yet they're they've got their talents in these stem areas and so if it's economically feasible to for them to stay in the private sector i think there's a lot of demand for that uh, and it's how we can leverage support for that uh, in a way that that is an opportunity an economic opportunity uh, and that's a way to uh, i think really um, take advantage of the talent that we have yeah, no, thank you, Kelly. And so one thing I did want to mention is, uh, it, you know, sort of you pointed out some of the uh, modification or uh, improvements we could do to the re diversity supplement. So one of the thing is the small business diversity supplement, uh, you know, for small businesses it reduces that time uh, to six months. So I think that, you know, is a little quicker. But also uh, you might, you know, for those folks who who joined the sessions yesterday, uh, you, you probably heard from um, my colleagues, Stephanie Fertig and Eric uh, Padmore about the uh, Biomedical Workforce Diversity Working Group. And one of the uh, issues they are looking into is the issue of diversity supplement and how can we really improve it and make it better and more, more impactful. So there is work going on from NIS in that regards. Uh, so in the last 10 minutes, let's get to some of the questions. Uh, one of the questions that I, I'm seeing quite a bit is, uh, is there a NIS academic partner database or how do I figure out who to partner with? Like, you know, is there something that uh, that could be used? And uh, so one thing I wanted to mention and is the NIH reporter tool. Uh, I think that's an extremely valuable tool. Uh, it's reporter.nis.gov. Uh, if you go to that tool, there is a feature called Matchmaker, which I think is you know really useful uh, for you to figure out uh, who is who the academic innovators are that might be working in your space, right? So if you go there and you put like a little you know blurb about your technology, it will give you one. It will give you the institute that is funding research in that space. It will also give you other projects that are similar to that project. So that's one way of finding out is there an academic institution or academic partner that is working in something similar? So that's one way of doing it. I mean, we don't have like a database per se. We don't put out like a, you know, a list of, uh, and I mean, in fact, you can go and find out every single academic investigators or small business projects we are funding through NIS Reporter, but that matchmaker tool is definitely very valuable. 
Uh, one question uh, I see here is, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, we're talking about uh, advantage of partnership to the small business. Uh, so, someone asked, like, what are some of the motivations for university to partner with small business? So uh, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. Yeah, I'll okay, start. there you go, Kelly. And, and, and we can, yeah, we can yes. the others go as well. Well, I mean, they want to license, you know, the technology. So they develop the technology and where's it going to go? Um, and so how to get it out there? And they need small businesses that are going to take it that direction. And to add plusing on top of that, ex increased exposure for their students in yeah. the marketplace, in the real competitive, highly competitive business marketplace is a great exposure for young folks to really learn what it's about really is. Uh, is a valued uh, contribution. Yeah. No, th thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that insight. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, uh, there is a lot for university. I mean, one is also, you know, it's money coming to the university. So universities always like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's definitely key they as well. They want their data raid. <laughs> yep. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so someone asked like about, I mean, it's, it's an interesting sort of way of thinking about it. Can you recommend a path to partner with an ac academic institution? If you're a small business, like, is there a... A, a playbook you could use or like what are some of the ways you could potentially do it so uh monique i see you nodding the head so you have any thoughts on that absolutely that's a fantastic question um so i would say start um with um two places one you can start um with the office of technology transfer um in your area um here in kentucky we're closely connected and partnered um at the hip um for kcv um, and so we are um, very happy to be a front door um, to talk through um, opportunities and academic partnership. Um, but I would also say, in addition to the technology transfer office, also have a good conversation um, with your local proof of concept network member. Um, the hub locations are located um, on the web. You can Google it. It pops right up and even has a convenient map. Um, and I can assure you the people that are involved in these proof of concept network hubs um, are really distinguished, um, really accomplished individuals. Um, for example, for our Kinetic Hub, um, it's led by two principal investigators, um, Dr. Dwoskin and Dr. Bates, um, who both have had a whole lot of commercialization success and have supported me through my journey um, of leadership and innovation. I'm originally from a rural Kentucky area, and we um, are very passionate together about creating more of those opportunities. Um, and so definitely, if you are a small business looking to partner, um, especially in your area, um, start with some of those front door opportunities and we'll get you connected to whatever you need. Thanks, Monique. Uh, so this is an interesting question. I think it sort of requires some uh, insights and thoughts. So, uh, so we talked about the benefit of partnerships, like how, I mean, I kind of, you know, sort of said, so the slide of if you partner with the academic institution, like the innovative ideas, it helps you with the review criteria like expertise and resources. Uh, and so what that might do is, I mean, someone, I, you know, sort of is asking, it could potentially have drawback as well, right? So you could think of it as like, now you are sort of promoting people who have academic partnerships and have that already built in, doesn't it go against promoting diversity? So are you sort of in some ways, in some ways penalizing. I mean, I don't think it really does, but uh, Jonathan, in terms of like, you know, I, maybe you can sort of give some of your thoughts on uh, how, you know, the partnership impact can really encourage diversity and, and build it. And one way we talked about is like, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, working with MSIs and that's one way of getting those into the fold, but any other thoughts on like how, or, you know, uh, how in fact it can really uh, improve the, the idea of diversity here? Yeah, and uh, the key word is intention. Um, if the partnerships are improved with a complementary objective, objective of diversifying, if you will, uh, the kinds of talent, the kinds of resources my company is connecting into, I think you'll be just fine. Uh, if perhaps uh, left to its own devices without a lens that complements, does not compete with, but complements 
uh, 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 business objectives, I think you'll get there. Um, I'm not as worried about that one. If, if we arrive there, I think we can course correct, but I think we're a long way from that one. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so there's a question for Kelly, uh, just you know, with your unique situation. Uh, could you talk, speak to lessons learned about keeping your business and your lab separate and mm -hmm. you know, yet leveraging the strengths? Like how do you sort of do that? Or do you, yeah, I mean, how do you make sure that you're leveraging all the strengths, but also keeping these two lives separate in some ways? It's Are you ask. Kelly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's all about transparency. You just have to constantly uh, talk about it and have all the right uh, paperwork and conflict of interest plans in place. But it actually has been easier than I thought it would be. Um, the, the other thing is that part of my workload includes some small business components. So 10% of my workload includes effort on the small business and commercialization at the university. So that helps at the gray areas. Um, but other than that, it's, it's pretty easy to, I mean, I'm the, when I'm doing research, it's part of the sub award to the university. So that's easy. So my role in the company side is, uh, you know, more of the administrative role and that's a very different mindset. So I know when I'm doing it and I just keep track of it separately. And it hasn't been as difficult as what I thought it would be. The hardest part is trying to find time for it all. And uh, so one usually suffers over the other. Yeah, I mean, someone asked, and I, you know, I think it, the answer is, and I would, you know, ask the panelists from their take, but how effective are these partnerships in recruiting students or postdocs as potential employees to the small business, right? I, I think I know that really should serve the purpose. And so uh, Monique and Kelly and Jonathan, anything you have seen from your experiences? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so with the Kentucky Commercialization Ventures Partnership, we engage faculty, staff, and students across the state. Um, so it is a, a potential population to um, interact in innovation of about over 200,000. Um, but I'm especially proud of our engagement with Kinetic, um, engaging faculty, staff, and students from across the state as well. Um, they are eligible for that award, um, that commercialization award, and it is an early stage investment. Um, so it is encouraging Kentucky innovators to get involved with innovation early um, and continue to grow their career, hopefully for a, um, a faculty, staff, or student spin out. Um, the beauty of us having technology transferred partner the entire way is that we're prepared to mentor and guide them through these decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that mixture of investment and mentorship is so important to achieve that level of success. Thank you, Monique. Uh, so we are at the uh, close of the session. So uh, I'm really I apologize to folks who asked questions that we didn't get to cover. Uh, but we will, as I said, uh, put those as FAQs and and put it on the conference site and the website. So we'll try to get all of those answered. Uh, but thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to the panelists uh, for you know really insightful discussion. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, we really hope everyone found this session useful. Uh, if you have any questions, take the opportunity to meet with a small business program expert for a 15 minute appointment this week. So you can go on the one on one uh, set tab on the on your on the app on the website and uh, request those meetings. Those meetings are extremely valuable because you can really get good feedback from these uh, pro experts who know the small business programs really well. Uh, visit the HHS and NIS uh, hub on the conference site and get to get started. Uh, if you have any issues, click the information tab and get help. Uh, thank you again. Thank you to uh, Kelly, Jonathan, and Monique. Uh, I, I wish we had more time to continue the conversation, but uh, we are limited with time and really appreciate you all uh, joining today and, and providing your feedback. And thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, right. I hope you, in, you have a good rest of the conference. And thank you to you and thank you to NIH for their interest in diversity. All right. I'll echo that. <laughs> Same. Thank you.